The rocky sea floor lay slippery underfoot as a rag-taggle party of eight made their way stealthily on foot across the causeway that appeared for only an hour a day at extremely low tides, toward the house on Pooh Island. The island itself was situated but a mile as the seagull flies from the prosperous and pungent fishing village of Pooh Bay off the Cornish coast. Had you been standing on the coast on that dark Christmas Eve in the winter of 1889, instead of enjoying the comfort of hearth and home and family as any sane person would, and looking out, you would doubtless have thought that said party looked like fireflies in the dusk, their lanterns held aloft as they pressed forward. Also known locally as Godforsaken Island, who had been in the private ownership of the reclusive millionaire Sir Percival Boland for decades, with access carefully managed and, aside from the causeway, landing was only possible via the night's boatman. But the boatman had recently been dismissed, due to his employer's demise. The island had a dread reputation and it would have taken either an exceedingly brave or exceedingly foolish soul to try their luck at crossing uninvited, as visitors were notoriously unwelcome. This party, however, were very much expected. As they drew ever closer to the rock, a flash of lightning illuminated the sole dwelling which towered threateningly above them. Silhouetted against a full moon, it looked to all the world as if it had been designed by a 16th century Gothic architect with a decidedly morbid imagination. Thunder rumbled close by. Adam Legrave, a junior solicitor, guided the party up the path that led to the house. Behind him followed Mallory Tingle, inveterate gambler and gigolo, Philida Tart, ingenue of the West End stage, Dr. Samuel Morg, physician, Teddy Strangelove, former athlete and sports journalist, Clytemnestra Smythe, psychic medium, and bringing up the rear, Ernestine Battle, the acerbic art critic, and her secretary and companion, Madeline Windrush. The lightning had grown incessant and lit their way to the front of the house. The storm broke above their heads just as they arrived at the door and with the rain tipping down, they huddled in the grand porch. Adam knocked repeatedly on the brass door knocker, but there came no response. Attributing this to the pandemonium of thunder, he turned the doorknob and, much to his surprise, the door opened with no resistance. They entered in without further hesitation, closing the door behind them, and in that instant, found themselves in silence. Not a blast of the trumpeting thunder penetrated within. It was as if they had suddenly been stricken stone deaf. This grand entrance was suffused with the soft light of the gas sconces on the walls, but there was no one in sight. Hello, Adam called. Anyone at home? There was no immediate response. Hello, Philida ventured. At last, there came the sound of the opening and closing of doors at a distance, then, from an alcove at the back of the hall, the housekeeper and her husband, the butler, emerged. Both were formally attired as befitted their duties, and after the briefest of introductions, Mr. and Mrs. Brownnose led the party through into the luxurious parlour. Phyllida stood in the middle of the room and spun round. Who knew, she declared, that I was related to such wealth? I think that could be said of all of us, my dear, Tingle replied, twirling his moustaches delightedly. Are we all very distant cousins, Mr. Legrave? Teddy asked. You are, yes, Adam replied, traced by Sir Percival's consulting detective, investigated fully and confirmed. And is there really to be a séance where the contents of the will will be revealed? Dr. Morgue inquired. There is, Adam confirmed. 
Sir Percival was an ardent devotee of spiritualism, and though I have a signed and verified copy of his last will and testament in my briefcase, it was a condition of said will that his wishes should first be communicated via a psychic medium, so as to prove there is indeed life after death. Hence, Miss Smythe being in attendance, the rest of you being potential benefactors. Miss Smythe gave a slight wave. Clytemnestra Smythe, but my friends call me Nesta. Thank you, Miss Smythe, came Ernestine's prissy response. Can we not just get on with it? Miss Battle, your blood pressure, twittered Madeline, as was her wont. Poppycock, Miss Battle retorted. And bar humbug, Teddy Strangelove said as a comic aside. I beg your pardon, young man. I, I said, uh, fancy a humbug? Teddy grinned, producing a paper bag from his pocket and offering it around. Quite frankly, I'd prefer a G&T, Dr. Morgue replied. I'm rather parched after all my exertions. Drinks and hors d'oeuvres were duly served with the promise of a late supper once the séance had been conducted. Mr. and Mrs. Brownnose retired to make preparations as the party of eight took their places around the dining table. A single, solitary candle illuminated the proceedings. If you wouldn't mind holding hands, Nesta requested then bowed her head. As long as I can keep my gloves on, came Miss Battle's disagreeable retort. There's always one, Teddy observed, sotto voce in Philida's ear. What did you say? Miss Battle snapped. Shh, said Dr. Morgue urgently. Nesta is establishing communication. Spirit of Sir Percival, are you with us? Silence. Spirit of Sir Percival, are you with us? Silence. Spirit of Sir Percival, are you... Oh, doesn't she go on, complained Ernestine Battle. Shh, Dr. Morgue urged again. I beg your... And then came a loud bang from above that resounded throughout the entire house and rattled the chandelier that now swayed precariously over their heads. Clytemnestra's chin dropped to her chest. Her eyes rolled back in her head. Her face took on the expression of a grasping, wrenching, covetous old sinner. She sucked in her breath before a deep, grizzled voice issued from her throat. It is I, the voice rasped, making the pendulous gypsy earrings rattle on Nesta's lobes. I, I, who is I? demanded Miss Battle. It is I, the voice barked, Sir Percival Boland. Pleased to meet you, Madeline chirruped in a polite attempt to fill the empty air. Who invited you? the voice boomed. I did, Miss Battle replied indignantly. Miss Windrush is my secretary's stroke companion, and she goes everywhere with... Be gone, cried the voice. And at this command, the door to the dining room inexplicably flew open behind her, and Madeline Windrush, clamped to her chair by unseen forces, was sucked backwards with alarming force through the open doorway, smashing into the brown noses who had been caught in listening at the keyhole and knocked them over like skittles. Her terrified screams were silenced only when the door slammed shut upon her exit into oblivion. The remaining guests sat open-mouthed stupefied with horror by this alarming spectacle and the unaccountable perversity of the shocking scene. I hope they'll be all right, Philad offered, without conviction. Who's next? asked the spirit. No one replied. No one dared. Boland continued after a pause. I have gathered you here tonight, not least to prove once and for all that the dead can communicate with the living. Beyond this, he went on, having no one to whom to leave my untold riches, I sought you out, my closest living relatives. He scoffed. 
And what a sad and sorry bunch you all turned out to be. A gigolo, a strumpet, a quack, a horn swoggler, and a hideous superannuated malicious old rat bag. I can assure you I am no strumpet, Miss Battle protested. Silence, roared the spirit. The next one to speak will not have the chance to live to regret it. After a pause, and with the threat still hanging heavy in the air, he continued in a more conciliatory manner. But seeing as how we are related, however remotely, I feel obliged to bequeath some small something. The silence was suddenly voluntary and expectant. To Mr. Mallory Valerie Tingle, compulsive gambler and Lothario, I leave a game of solitaire and a lifetime supply of bromide. To Miss Phyllida Rain Tart, theatre ornament and floozy, a course of acting lessons, and as a fallback, a broom to sweep the stage. To Dr. Samuel Lloyd Morgue, medical charlatan, I leave an unnecessary surgical procedure and a taste of his own medicine. To Mr. Edward Everett Fletcher Strangelove, a.k.a. Elmer Grocock, Bernard Scrivens and Penelope Rumpole, fraud and flimflam artist, I bequeath a cheque made out to reality and a bottle of truth serum. And to Miss Ernestine Theodora Battle, poisonous malcontent and all-round bad egg, I leave a bowl and a set of wooden spoons on the clear understanding that they be used to stir up anything other than her customary hornet's nest. The rest of my considerable fortune I leave to psychic research. The deathly hush remained. Even Phyllida's tears were silent. Abruptly, Adam Legrave pushed back his chair, got to his feet and addressed those assembled. I have a signed and verified copy of Sir Percival's will in my briefcase, which I took the precaution of reading in advance of tonight's event and can now confirm that it bears no relation whatsoever to the utter piffle we have just sat through. Correction, said the spirit. You had a signed and verified copy of the will. And so saying... The briefcase burst into flames even as the curtains drew back and the French windows flew open to fan the fire. Then, by some unseen hand, Adam Legrave was dragged by his tie out into the torrential downpour and was instantly hit by a lightning bolt of such power and magnitude that it caused his whole body to writhe in a grotesque parody of a dance, to snap, crackle and pop as waves of electricity shot through him. Finally, his blackened corpse dropped onto the paved terrace as the windows slammed shut and the curtains drew together so as to obscure his cremated remains. For God's sake, Mallory cried, jumping to his feet. Let us get out of this dreadful place. Not so fast, Sir Percival crowed. I have one last surprise. And with this... The giant chandelier above their heads dropped from its lofty height, bringing the ceiling down, the joists and the entire contents of the fully furnished room above it, and in so doing, killed them all instantly. If they weren't squashed like so many flies, they were impaled, smothered or buried alive, their gut-wrenching screams along with them. The dust settled. And silence reigned. But the collapse of the ceiling had the unexpected consequence of destabilising the very walls, and slowly but surely, the cursed house began to collapse in on itself like a house of cards, screeching and sobbing and howling as it met its dreadful end. The torrent of sound created by its demise being heard as far as Pooh Bay and beyond. Quite why Sir Percival Boland had effected this massacre is anyone's guess, 
and destined to remain a mystery. For with the death of those assembled, he had also killed off his one channel of communication, Nesta Smythe. For surely no other medium would entertain him going forward. Perhaps he hadn't thought things through properly. Or perhaps he was simply insane. As Sir Percival was deemed to have died in testate, the government took over his estate on trust. After seven years due process, his entire fortune went to the Crown and the island was bought by the Pooh Wildlife Trust for the nominal price of ten shillings and sixpence. It has been preserved as a nature reserve in perpetuity. Alas, no wildlife will live there, nor plant life flourish and it remains barren to this day. <laughs>